All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Shavi. I'm a product manager uh, at LinkedIn. Um, looks like today's event is so popular that we're getting a lot of spin <laughs> to ask people <laughs> to join a separate URL, sometimes with my name there. So just look out. Don't join the spin and stay in. Uh, I'll make sure I work with the in, uh, LinkedIn trust team uh, to avoid such, a, such spammy events happening again. So uh, apologize for the attack. But Today is a very exciting series. We're very, very honored to have a special guest. Um, so I'm running a four-part series with Phil, uh, author of The Never Search Alone, founder of Collaborative uh, Game. Yay. And Phil <laughs> has devoted the last 25 years to help top talents in internet and product management companies to build great product companies and careers. Uh, and for those of you who has been listening to my PM learning series, knew that from last year, uh, we did a session with Theo and Priya, and it was a really, really, uh, you know, uh, valuable and insightful session. session. And we want to expand on it, right? Given today's challenging, uh, tough job environment, a lot of layoffs. So I think this is a very meaningful initiative. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and in a moment, we'll be introducing our special guest, uh, the wonderful Marty Kagan, many of you know. Uh, but before we get to Marty, uh, maybe folks can introduce, drop in the chat where you're joining us from, what questions you have for Theo and Marty, specifically related to product job search. Um, and I'm going to ask Theo to kick it off and speak a few words about what is Never Search Alone. Great. It's great to be here. Thank you for putting this four-part series together, Shivy, and excited to have Marty Kagan join us, the wonderful Marty Kagan. And as Shivy said, yeah, put, put where you're, look at that, Nigeria, Los Angeles, Georgia, Paris, Italy. Love seeing where you're all from. Keep, keep that up in the chat. Um, so we're talking, this is a four-part series based on my book, Never Search Alone, Never Search Alone. Now, it's important for you to know that I took a product management mindset to disrupt and reinvent the way people look for a job. So there's three big ideas in Never Search Alone. The first is the title, Never Search Alone, right? Put together a job, what we call a job search council or a mutual support group so that you can do this together. Now, the most important finding in the last 25 years of research is that no matter who you are, no matter whether you're a public company CEO looking for your next job or even a board seat, whether you're an individual contributor in product and looking for that next IC role or maybe a step up to manager, a college student looking for your very first job, a chief product officer with a great track record, no matter who you are, when you're in the job search, you're going to be anxious and fearful, okay? It doesn't matter how qualified you are, you are going to experience those things. And it turns out the best way to address that is to put together a small support group, what we call a job search council, job search council. Because if you bring together three or four people who are nervous and anxious, just bringing them together and having them share that converts that nervousness and anxiety into hope, motivation, accountability, and the most important thing in the job search, confidence. So that's idea number one. Now there's other reasons, and Marty and I are going to talk about that, to have a support group. Like, for example, when you get to the point of potentially interviewing with a company, how do you know is that a good company to go work for and to have that support group to help you answer that question? But that's the first idea, never search alone. Number two, if product market fit, all of us know product market fit, it drives business success, it's absolutely crucial, we all believe in it. Well, if that's key for business success, candidate market fit, candidate market fit is key to career success. Basically what I'm telling you, is before you start networking and interviewing, just take a moment to figure out, think about what you want and the market reality, how the market sees you. And then you iterate that through your process. Okay, so candidate market fit. And we can talk more about that. We're going to actually have an entire session on job search councils. We're going to have an entire session on candidate market fit. And then we're also going to have an entire session on the last of the three big ideas, which is what I call the four legs to the negotiation stool. How to negotiate to get what you need to succeed in the role. It includes comp. Comp is one leg, the compensation, including, of course, equity, restricted uh, stock units, whatever it might be, actual uh, options, whatever. But it also is budget, resources, and support. Budget, resources, and support. All of what you need to succeed. In fact, I tell you, when you're interviewing, you're the boss of the interview process. In fact, I say, 
You have to write your own job description. I call it a job mission with OKRs. You present that to the company, they're going to be blown away. It also gives a great context to discuss, is this really the role? Is there a lot? Because how many of us thought we were taking job A and it was job B when we got there, right? And it increases the odds that you're going to get an offer. They're going to be blown away that what you're doing. And then when you get the offer, you use the job mission with OKRs. And that's the basic idea of what are you signing up to be accountable for? To negotiate for budget resources and support as well as comp. And by the way, by negotiating for budget resources and support, not only do you set yourself up to succeed, you impress the company even more, which can sometimes lead to them being willing to give you even more compensation. So those are the three big ideas. Never search alone, candidate market fit, and four legs to the negotiation stool or job mission with OKRs and you know, ask for what you need to succeed. So those are the three big ideas. And we have a free community at phil.org, phyl.org, where you can sign up for a job search council for free. And we will give you training for free because we have all of these longtime volunteers, all these longtime leaders in tech and product who are donating their time to help. Okay. So we want, you can do that today. Go to phil.org. We hope that you take advantage of that if you're in the job search, whether you're in, in a job and looking for your next one or you're unemployed. All right. So, Shivi, that's, that's the basic context, right? And we have three more shows after today where we're going to dive into job search councils, candidate market fit, and the negotiations. Shall we go ahead and bring the wonderful Marty Kagan in now? And let's have a conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. So many things to talk about. First of all, the chat just blowed up. <laughs> Marty, I don't know. And Theo, you guys have so many fans globally from Morocco, London, Canada, every part of U.S., South Africa, wow. India, you know, Seattle. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and again, three parts, uh, four part theory kicking off today with Marty. Uh, make sure you sign up for the remaining parts if you want to dive into specifics. Hopefully you join all four of them. Uh, the links are included in the event description. So make sure you don't uh, you don't miss out. Um, and then Marty, obviously, I think a lot of you know about him. Marty founded the Silicon Valley product group in 2003 to pursue his interests in helping to create successful products that company uh, that uh, users love, right? I, I am all-time favorite user, a reader of Marty's book, How to Inspire, How to Create Tech Products Customers Love, as well as the recent, last year he released uh, Empowered, uh, Ordinary uh, People, Extraordinary Products. A lot of leadership principles about how to build strong product teams and love and love and rac uh, heavily book. recommend that. So can't wait to hear from Marty today. But before that, we go into that, I just want to highlight a couple comments from the from the audience who's f fans of the Never Search Alone and uh, Job Search Console approach. So Coraline, who's going to be in our next session as a, as a guest, already mentioned about, hey, an amazing tool, help me get my current well, job. Coraline's a director of product at Glassdoor, and she, she was one of the early readers of the book that really helped developed the concepts in the book and ran one of the first job search councils, which is amazing. You're going to hear from her in our next session. Yeah. Yeah. And then from Haiti, I have the privilege of editing the early edition of the book. Again, product management, uh, you know, in practice as part of developing the book, right? Leveraging learning to secure the first for-profit board seat. Nice. That's a Heidi. really awesome uh, achievement. And then Joshua loves the candidate marketing fit is, is a game changer. If nothing else, read a book from Jill. And then uh, also more folks starting the job search console this year and already feeling the support, uh, you know, and success uh, from, from us being part of the console. So our next session, we'll talk specifically about the job console. And if any of you wanted to join, uh, please make sure you, you sign up. So thank you so much, folks, for, you know, joining us today and sharing some of your success examples now, without further ado, I like to get started. And for folks, if you have any question about um, you know job search related to product for Marty or Theo, please drop them in the chat, and we'll pick them out from time to time to make sure we have a good conversation and be valuable to this community. Now, Marty, you wrote you know a beautiful uh, foreword to the book Never Search Alone. In that foreword, you spoke very highly about Theo and their approach. No. You said. You know, you know, Phil for decades and, you know, what really sets Phil apart is how he was able to harness the power of community, right? Um, 
Can you, maybe both of you share about how does the power of community play a role, uh, you, you know, in helping candidates um, find better jobs, find better product jobs? Yeah. Marty, do you mind taking that first? I'd love to. Uh, no problem. <laughs> you know, I, I um, for background or context, I've been talking with Phil about this topic for I don't know how many years, maybe even a decade, a long, long time. Um, and I, for example, in that book, Empowered, I wrote about hiring like crazy. Yeah. There's whole sections, but it's all from the perspective of the manager. It's all from the perspective of the hiring company. It's trying to help hiring companies get better at recruiting, get better at coaching, get better at developing people. And, uh, you know, what I what I was talking with Phil about all along was like, who who talks about the job seeker? Yeah. It's like, and really, I couldn't point to a single book that was any good that talked about from the pers perspective of the job seeker. And even though this is not officially what Phil was doing necessarily with his counsels for many years, it's something that's always been going on. Yeah. And what Phil is different at is fundamentally he's a community organizer, right? He yeah. understands the power of community. And that's um, it's just so obviously valuable because if you just look at the typical job recruiting process, you have a whole corporation with lawyers and compensation specialists and professional managers, professional HR, and you got one little individual contributor trying to get in there. It's not even a fair fight. It's not even, a, you know, it's not, not fair. And so many people, well, Phil said this at the beginning, and in, in his, his intro got me all, all uh, fired up about looking for a job. But, um, you know, so many people, they, uh, they just, they get, they take whatever and then they get there and the honeymoon's over in a couple of weeks and they go, oh my gosh, and I joined this terrible company. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a very important concept and I'm very happy the book is out. I've been recommending it to everybody, even before the economy kind of opened up all these extra positions. And so uh, I and I also tell people the best time to get good at this stuff is before you even need it. So get ready, and yeah. we all will. Yeah, thank you, Marty. It's true, and I, I just want to acknowledge Marty's role. Marty and I've been talking about it for a long time, and he was really pushing me for a long time. You got to get this Maggie. book out. <laughs> so Maggie. thank Marty. You, you know, if it weren't for Marty, the book wouldn't be out yet. So. <laughs> Not just that, but but the concept. Um, Marty's been a great thought partner to me, obviously, and to so many of us. You've inspired, uh, to use a word, and empowered. <laughs> um, but thank you, Marty. It really means a lot. Shivy, I know. You, did you want to ask another question, or did yeah, you want to yeah, highlight sure. some? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a lot of question and comments floating up, so I'm trying to try to try edge some of that. But before we get into that, I think Marty, uh, one thing you pointed out in your foreword is that you know, in an ideal world, right, we want people to, you know, love what they do, feeling empowered, doing meaningful work, and just like waking up every day excited to go to work. But sadly, the reality is that so many people are, you know hated what they do, basically. They, you know, we have a lot of survey about employee engagement is a problem. Product teams are probably not empowered to really execute on the vision, to find the vision for, for a lot of reasons. Uh, what do you think is causing this kind of disconnect um, between well, what people want to do with their career and what's actually happening? How, yeah, well, how can you, in your coaching, like what advice do you give to people to get more control over their career destiny? Yeah. Sure. Well, this is a multifaceted issue. For example, a lot of the problem is on the, the, the manager side, the hiring manager side. They've, they've now recruited somebody, but they don't know how to develop them. They don't know how to develop their career. They, none of this stuff is going on. And so even if it is potentially a really good job, they are often missing other pieces. And other parts are what really Phil was alluding to that the uh, the job seeker side, they have not really portrayed themselves. I, I mean, I like Phil, I do a lot of these sort of one-on-one -on -one sessions where I talk to people about, you know, tell me your career, you know, tell me your goals. I usually start by looking at their LinkedIn profile and, you know, 
the, probably the most common situation is people are actually qualified for much more, lots of different things. And then it gets a little more interesting because it's like, yeah, that's what, what we want to do is not just what you're qualified for, but what do people really need and what are you good at? Yeah. Really, you know, so that we can get this candidate market fit. Uh, that concept, I remember the fir- the draft that Bill had, it, and I was like, this resonated immediately because it is. It's product market fit. One of the things I tell people all the time is that they are their own product, right? You know, you've got to realize <laughs> you kind of are. And in LinkedIn profiles, kind of how you market yourself as a product. So um, that's, that's what we're trying to... Um, encourage people to consider all these different elements. And sometimes, uh, well, we can talk about this later, but a lot of times the problem is in their LinkedIn profile. They are not, because if you're a hiring manager, you're looking for somebody that wants exactly that job. You're not looking for somebody that's qualified for a dozen different things. Totally. Uh, And we have this conversation so often, Marty, right? People are like, I want to keep it wide. No, do not do that. You have to have a focused candidate market fit. You're going to have, do you keep pro, the product market fit wide? Oh, my product could be for anybody, for anything, mm. really. No, that's not going to work. It doesn't work here either. Yeah. Let's dive in because I, I do see a couple Good. couple pointers of questions related yeah. to that. Um, yeah. And the first one that's came up, maybe for Phil, um, we touch upon product market fit, sorry, candidate market fit. And we want it to be narrow and specific. Like you said, not just what you're qualified for, what you can do, but specifically, like, what does the market need and what the hiring manager need? What are the different things you should be considered when it comes to, like, figure out what's the right product market fit, how you tell a yeah. story, how do you know what the uh, yeah. what the hiring companies want? Not all job descriptions are very yeah. well written. That gives Most you are not. Truth. Most are not. Right? Which is why I tell you, you have to write your own. Um, so, look. You know, one of the things that Marty talks a lot about, which I so much agree with, is that any product manager, you need, you need to have time to think. That You know, very few people carve out time to think. And so the first thing I say about candidate market fit is think for a moment about what you want. It's, it's remarkable how few people do that. They just skip right over that step. No, I, you know, so what do you want? You know, now, often people have a hard time answering that question. I understand that. They may not know for sure. We have a process. We call it the Manukin two-pager where you draft out what you want, what you love, what you don't want. And then you go and do some research. You do what I call a listening tour to, to understand both how the market sees you, but also to kind of think out loud and begin to iterate. The idea is at the end of that process, and we have a structured process with different kinds of interviews and questions to do the research. I, I outline in the book. And by, And by the way, I just want people to know that um, we, we're like, if you join a job search council, we require that you either read the book or read a summary draft that's free and watch 10 hours of free videos that this isn't some, we're not just trying to get you to buy the book. We obviously would like you to buy the book and it's available in 20 countries. Most importantly, we want you to put this methodology into action, right? And people, people, you know, they just, they skip over this stuff. So they skip over what they want. They skip over doing any thinking or any research on the market realities and how they're perceived. Um, And they just, they, and they just go out there and start with networking and interviewing. And it's as if they've built a product without spending a moment thinking about what the customer might need or want or what's going on with competition or what's out in the marketplace. Right. So I, I'm not saying do this for months. You know, it's like, it's just, I'm take a moment, think a little bit and your job search council will help you do that. Help you because the thing about slowing down to think, which is why many people don't do it, especially if you're already anxious, is it can increase your anxiety because suddenly you're not running around. You're like pausing, right? And it can flood in your insecurities, which is why you need a support group so you can handle that and take the moment you deserve. You deserve taking time to invest in yourself to figure out what you love and want and go find that. As, as Marty, I totally agree, Marty. Very pe- often people underestimate what they could what they could achieve. They just take the first thing that comes along and it's suboptimal. And then they're unhappy. And then they're stuck in a loop, right? Whereas Marty, I'm sure you've seen this, right? If someone makes a good choice or gets lucky and they they land in a good company with a good job, it it transforms their whole career. And um, life. Yeah, and life. Yeah. So can I add, yeah. Can I add a little of that? I because I and and I'm I've 
I will sort of trigger alert what I'm about to say might trigger some people, but it is really, I mean this in a sense of, of uh, yeah. tough love. I mean, comes yeah. from a good place. This, this thinking about really, this is not always easy. And I find that there's two things going on and they, they're, they're both hitting on this. The first, and I'm going to be honest, especially with women, imposter syndrome. They feel like they're not qualified for so many things. And I, I, I occasionally lose patience and I'm going, what are you talking about? There is not a single man alive that would, would even hesitate for two seconds. And you, you know, you don't think you're qualified for this job. That is just crazy. And I'll, I'll tell them. And, you know, a lot of times they trust me that if I tell them they really are qualified for this, that they believe me. But so many people don't. And one of the advantages to a council, a support group, is that you've got people that that care enough about you to tell you this. Now, the the upside is imposter syndrome. There's people are capable of much more. The part that's harder is the flip side, which is blind spots. That's right. I talk to a lot of people that have blind spots. They think they're awesome at certain things. And I'm like, you know, I don't really want to be the first one to tell you this, but I don't think you're so awesome at this. Yeah. And if it's if it's really about candidate market fit, it doesn't do them. I'm not doing them any favors if I puff them up and they go and land the job. Totally. It's not actually that hard to fool a high, an interview team. It's not that hard to get a job, but then they're, it's not going to last. It's not going to go well. And that's going to totally demoralize them, Marty, and it's going to really affect their career. I totally agree. Keep going. Well, so those two things, identifying your blind spots, but also getting out of this imposter syndrome that so many of us suffer from, uh, that's why I love them to have a trusted set of people, also known as a job search council, that can tell them these things. Yeah, totally. And I, and, I and I'll this. just... Uh, oh, go ahead. Should we go ahead? No, I, I just wanted to say that the LinkedIn community has really resonated with what you said. Like, Marty, imposter syndrome is the beast. It shows up every day. And then most importantly, thank you for saying this out loud, Marty. I remember in business school, I'll pass it to you, Phil, after I made this remark. Uh, there's studies about if there's 10, 10 qualifications in a job, a man might look at, okay, I checked two or three box. Good enough. Learn on the job, right? We'll figure things out. Women will be looking at it like, okay, I meet 11, like 10, all 10, plus maybe one or two more. Now I feel like I'm qualified and confident. So I I actively use that example to remind myself to like, hey, check in. Is it imposter syndrome speaking or am I not really the second problem having blind spot? Right. And, 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 And again, the research shows we all have it. Women have it more. Black people, like, you know, folks who where there's been historic discrimination, LGBTQ, you know, they'll question themselves more. And, um, you know, one, one, I'll, I'll just give you a quick story. We had a, a woman, a job seeker on a job search council. She was a, a, a chief product officer, uh, had been a, a very, very accomplished. Um, and she was doing an interview and, oh, excuse me, she was doing a listening tour to kind of think about her candidate market fit for her next step. And this, one of the things about listening to her is not every conversation is going to be amazing. And you need a job search council to help you parse that, right? So this one person was like, oh, you're not poised enough, which I can tell you, I, very few men get that kind of time. <laughs> that almost never, you know, but she, she was like, what? She brought it back. And they like really helped her parse that. Like, this is, this is bogus. But, but also another woman on the council said, you know, there's a, the little thing of truth there is that you grew up. She happened to have grown up on a commune, like didn't go to school, like, and she can sometimes overcompensate for that, right? So, you know, there was like, it was both, it both wasn't helpful and there was a grain of truth that she could use that would help her in her next, in her next interview. Like, you can't do that by yourself. There is just no way you can do that by yourself, right? And, uh, you know, and sometimes you, as Marty said, the blind spot, like, you know, people will come to me and say, hey, I'm, you know, I want a VP of product role. And I look at like, you're, I'm sorry, but you're not, you're not ready for that role. That's not going to be good. You know, but that's a hard thing to tell somebody, you know, and recruiter, you know, so I, I tell people as part of their interviews, go talk to a recruiter, ask three questions. What job could I get today? What job with no sweat? What job could I maybe get that's a stretch? And what's outside my ballpark? Recruiters love those three questions because they're almost never asked that. 
they're always like, hey, get me a VP of product role. And of course, like, well, I get you know, it's like really hard to say. So you're like, well, you know, you could get a you could get a director of product role in a smaller startup. You could probably get an IC role in at Google or something like that. And uh, no, chief product officer is not for you. Like that's not where you're at. And so, like, you know, the, the, the what I say in the book is look, the product, the candidate market fit, it's it's not about it's not a personal indictment of you. We're trying to understand objective market realities here and how the market sees you. And even sometimes maybe you're a little bit more qualified than the market sees you, but because of your unique background, people aren't going to trust you for that. You just need, it's not about you, it's about the market. So then how do you get there, right? So you have to take sometimes multiple steps. And it's just recruiters and come, it's so helpful when people have already gone through this before the interview or they start applying for jobs because they have a real practical approach. Okay. This is what I want. Like we, Priya talked about this in our, in our call last, last year, she had been a chief product officer in a, in a very small startup. And she herself put together a job search council early on and then realized, you know what? I can't, I don't really know product that well. I haven't worked in a great product culture. I've been the only product person. She went and took an IC role at a great product company. It was a brilliant move for her career. It was really what she needed to do. And it's transformed and it's gone extremely well. You know, thankfully she was able to, you know, see that. And it wasn't about, in her case, imposter syndrome. It was the reality that like, like she hadn't had that, that product training yet with a great product culture. And she recognized that. And it, her career has been a rocket ship at this company where she's gone to. It's really changed everything. Um, if you do this by yourself, Really hard to do these things. Really hard to navigate. Okay. I, I love this. I just want to say, I looking at the events count, 30 minutes in, and we will stay oh, past a little bit for folks. We still have a lot of questions to get through. We have almost 600 concurrent live viewers right now listening to the three of us. Wow. So Big Win is definitely one of the more, more popular events. And then throughout the, the, the week, more people will listen to our insights. So really exciting. Um, Maybe, I can do I just say about... Double can I just say one thing? Happy, sad. Happy there's so many people here. Sad that there's so much need because of what's going on on the market. I'm just glad we have a community for you. But if you've been laid off, I'm sorry. Like, that's tough. But go ahead. So go ahead, you. Yeah. No, I, I just want to say folks have already started to, you know, try to sign up for Job Search Console from feel.org. Uh, excited to see how this goes and looking forward to learn. So, Marty, I wanted to ask you a couple questions, potentially specific to the product job search, right? Um, we know that Kaylin mentioned that it's important to narrow down your focus so that you can focus on your strengths and what the market needs to say you're up for success. I do think there are a couple variations for, for this. The first question I had, um, okay, this one, is this notion of being a product journalist versus a product specialist. Let's say you focus on a particular domain, you're AI PM or mobile PM or consumer PM enterprise. You know, what's your advice for people looking for, let's say a new product job and say they might have experience in one domain. How do they either bottom themselves or how, did, how should they be thinking about their career? Being a journalist, a specialist, the T-shape, which right. direction do you go? Okay, well, this is uh, a good example of what a, the layers of complexity you can get and where a council could actually help because I, I have a very clear answer and I think the best product people, Sri Doshi says the same thing and I'll just get that out of the way, but then I'm gonna give you a second answer. It's a little more practical for the job search market, which is, so the, the straightforward answer is, yeah, it's not about the domain. You know, we would much rather have a strong product person because they can learn a new domain in a few months than somebody that, say, comes out of the banking industry and they want to be a product, online banking product manager. We would much rather have that. That said, that assumes the hiring manager has got a clue. <laughs> right. Many of the hiring managers, you can see this in the job descriptions, many of the companies... They, the HR people, they're like, oh, we need somebody from the banking industry. And I'm like, do you realize why the banking industry hardly innovates at all? Maybe there's a relationship here. So this is why um, it matters so much to understand the company you're applying to. 
and where they are. To me, the most important thing is not whether it's Google or whether it's Netflix or whether it's some brand that you know everybody's impressed by. What matters is who will be hiring you yeah. and whether they will develop you. Yeah. So I care so much. In fact, the kind of thing I, I pull on my network for is to learn more about these hiring managers when I'm helping somebody find a job. I want to like know who are you going to work for? Yeah. You know, okay, it's great. You're at Amazon. Wonderful. But the truth is right. not every manager at Amazon is awesome. Right. A, a lot of them are, but they're not all awesome. And so I want to know, like, what group will you be in? Let's talk yeah. about that because we can probably find somebody that can tell us where that person's really coming from. So important. And, and to add, Marty, like in the book I talk about, I, I call it back channel due diligence. Like you got to find out who is your hiring manager and what to, you know, go behind the scenes, try to find out what do other people say about this person? What, you know, how are they as a manager? You know, what are their skills? And if it's in product, what are their, what are their product skills? Are they a good coach? You know, such a key thing that so many product managers are not good at, right? So I mentioned Priya before she went to a great organization, but her manager, we, we spent a lot of time on that and they are a great coach and that's made a huge impact on her trajectory uh, in the last year. I mean, real, you know, she's, she's been a big part of that, but having that coach whew, made a big difference. Absolutely. I think Farad just responded and say, amazing approach, Marty. Uh, as a, uh, you know, grateful for your response to his question, as well as well said, Marty, optimized for, for managers. Now, the next variance that I wanted to touch upon, there's three variants. So we touched about journalists versus specialists. I think the other question that asks a lot, I'll just quote one uh, question from earlier. It's a long question, but I'll summarize it as there are a lot of people trying to transition into product nowadays. They're a mid-career pivoter. They have some experience either in software engineering in this case or some other scenarios. Like you're looking to pivot into product because everyone talks about product nowadays, right? How do you how do you best position yourself to do that? Like what concrete ways can you like can you upskill yourself? How can you position yourself? How do you carry that conversation with a hiring manager? Maybe when they're doubtful of like, can you do this job? But you knew you can, and you're trying to actively overcome your imposter syndrome. So Marty, what's your approach for like pivoters with some level of relevant mid-career experience outside of product? Yeah, well, the first thing I say, it's normally much easier to pivot from your current position in a current company. So for example, if you're a developer, uh, with your company, they, you show them your contributions, you say you want to learn these things, and they help you do that. Many, many companies love that because to them, the risk is much lower, right? They know you, they trust you, they know your strengths, they know your blind spot, they know that. And they, uh, I was one of those people that I wanted to move from engineering to product and the company was willing to invest in me and do that. It's harder to do that when you're making really two jumps, changing companies and changing roles, because that is much higher risk for the new company, obviously. So one of the things, um, uh, you, when you're doing your research on the company, different companies have different philosophies. Of course, if, it was, if I could control the world, then they'd all really have a common understanding of what a strong product person is, but they don't. Some of them are very different than others. And of course, if you really want a job with that company, you kind of have to know what they're looking for and you have to make sure. Now, in a good product company, there's some very common things. So for example, strong technology background yeah. is very common. It's not 100% common, but it's very common. And some people are coming from engineering. It's like, you're in great shape. You've checked that box. There's some other areas to go look at. On the other hand, other people tell me, like, I've, I know nothing about the technology. They're very insecure about that. And I push them to take a course at, a, at some academic course in some programming language. And I'm not trying to convince them to become a developer. I am trying to get, build their confidence and their knowledge on a different way of thinking about problems. Yeah. And it works. It doesn't mean, you know, some companies, some people tell me they love it. Most people tell me they did not love it, but they all benefited from it. So there are many things you can do. There's other people like I, before I was allowed to be a product person, I had to go take a finance course 
I had, I knew nothing about finance and the person coaching me was like, I can't believe you don't know any of this stuff, but <laughs> I was an engineer. I had zero courses in that in college. I just, uh, and it was one of those, uh, I, I didn't even know it was something I needed to know, mm. but, um, but uh, he made very clear. Yes, <laughs> you do need to know it now. I think it just shows how clueless I was. I didn't even know what I didn't know, but, but, you know, I had somebody who cared enough about me to make sure they pointed out these blind spots and then help me fix them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I love that. All right. The next variation. So we're leveling up from how do I pivot into product to let's say you currently work at a company, maybe smaller company as a senior director of product, but now maybe you're looking for more stable jobs in a more mature company, the calibration of product title, you know, when you're going from different stage of company, um, how do you go about figuring out, you know, what level you should apply? Because different company categorize different product levels differently. Um, how to be smart about that um, so that it's not off-putting like what um, McKinsey said here, like, hey, I was a senior director from a smaller company. Now I'm coming in interviewing with senior PM that maybe people are like, wow, you know, <laughs> is it too high of a title to talk to? Like, how do you, and then without losing your credibility, right? How, how do you figure yeah. out how to, That's how to good. have that conversation and be smart about the varying level in product? Yeah. Let me just say, this has always been a question. However, over the last five years or so, there has been so much title inflation at so many companies that it's a bigger problem than it's ever been in my 40 years of experience. Mm -hmm. So this is a very legit question. And, you know, when I was saying a lot of people, their LinkedIn profiles are really not doing them any favors. <laughs> and this is one of those examples where they will often be boxing themselves in. I, I, I have had so many people tell me that they were essentially offended by the uh, the recruiters at this big companies because they say like you know you're no nowhere near qualified even for a director and they're going I've been a senior vice president uh, you know and they're and I'm like well they know what that really means yeah and you know for them maybe a senior manager yeah so, so that's a, a bit of that reality check and I try to get people on their profile. Uh, to to make sure they're not excluding themselves where they, you know, where where they shouldn't, so that they leave it open. So I'm I never suggest you know being inaccurate, but you can absolutely be more general. That's a good way to think about it. Thank you. And then now moving further up, um, we have this question from Shira. Let's say looking at more like leveling up, right? Let's say you have been a group PM, you know, maybe at a tech company for a while. You're really trying to push yourself to that next level, to the executive leadership level. What do you think about going about, like, you know, having that conversation and being able to push for a bigger, better role? Um, potentially going from a big, I, I would assume, from a bigger company to a smaller company so they have bigger scope, more management responsibilities, um, and vice versa. So... Yeah, I mean, I I have thoughts too, but Phil, do you want to you want to start on that one? Well, again, it's you know, um, so my, my next book is going to be called Never Never Lead Alone, talking about you know, in jobs, how do you how do you make better decisions? How do you manage the promotion thing? One of the most interesting things I find about people who want to upgrade to it, let's say let's say they're a group PM and they want to get to a director level, let's say and eventually VP. I asked them a very simple question. Does your manager know this? And I cannot tell you how many times the answer is no. You have not told your manager. You have to tell your manager and then ask them for help. Like, what do I need to do to be able to get to that director level? And, be, and managers love this, unless they're a bad manager. Right. If they're a good manager, it's like you love hearing that the people you are managing are ambitious. They want to grow. They want to learn. And then it's it's often often sometimes the very question leads to the promotion almost within months. Sometimes, but sometimes it takes a year or two because there's you know it's clear like Marty said he didn't have finance background right or you don't you know you you are not really good at managing influence across the organization you know you're not you know you're still too close 
You don't know how to manage people effectively. You're not a coach yet, whatever it might be. There's going to be practical things you're going to need to learn. But it's, it's just shocking to me how many people don't ask, what does it take to get there and, and, and let them know, I want that. Does that... Uh, is that true, Marty, from your Absolutely. Point of view? And also, I also put the blame because all it takes is really one person to raise this, this the employee or the manager. But I, I remember the very first time I had a man, when I, one of my managers sat down with me, a new manager, and said, just so you know, Marty, my job is to get you promoted. And I'm like, wow, nobody's ever said that. That's so like amazing. Yeah. And, and really was. And, and so, to me, now this is a little later, you know, in this candidate market fit process, it doesn't end when you get the job. <laughs> it, you know, it's, yeah. that's where this becomes more relevant. To me, the first thing I encourage people to ask for is an assessment. Have that, you know, hiring manager do that assessment so that they can get you started on your progression. Because that's what a good manager does with his or her people is they, they um, develop them. And so yeah. right after the assessment, there's a coaching plan. And so if if I tell, well, let me frame it this way. If the person I've just hired says, you know, I really love to eventually be a VP of product. I get that mm -hmm. all the time. I'd love to. You know, Wonderful. That's a great role. Let's, I love helping people get there. Let's, let's start. We'll start with an assessment. I've just hired you, so I know a little bit about you, but I'm going to see you in action over the next weeks and months. So let, once we understand this, I want to help and we'll do a coaching plan. And yeah. maybe the first thing is to get you to director level and then we'll get you to the VP level. Great. This is what a good manager does. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. All you managers out there, listen to that. <laughs> and if your manager isn't doing of, that with you, get a better manager or at least bring it up yourself. You know, can we do an assessment of my skills? Because I want to get promoted. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's why I was that's why Evelyn was saying that not very often do we come across a manager whose goal is like really helping to push you to the next level. So that brought me actually I to my know next if question. I agree with that, Marty, do you? Well, you know, this is why I wrote the book Empowered, because I see yeah. too many managers like that. However, yeah. and of course, Google just had this huge layoff and a lot of questions mm -hmm. around that. But you might have noticed, because uh, there's been some news coverage of this lately, over the last couple of years, Google, you know, they're constantly doing surveys of their people and asking questions about what makes a great team, what makes a great manager. And they shared some of their data. Do you know what the top rated trait was of a successful, well-regarded manager at Google was, they're known as a good coach. Mm. Do you know what the second trait was? They're known as an empowering manager and not a micromanager. Mm. So this is not a secret at good companies. That's why you heard what Phil said. I mean, at good companies, they get this. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, they're not all good companies, but I will tell you, like at Apple, coaching is one of the pillars of a manager. At Microsoft, there's three pillars of a manager and good coaching is one of them. And it's like, you already heard it with Google. This is not unusual to good companies. What we need as an industry is to get more good companies, but that's yeah. uh, the subject of another call. <laughs> And a long-term <laughs> effort, <laughs> long-term effort we're, we're engaged in, yeah. I, I do want to ask this, I, I consider the, the million dollar question, because we've been talking a lot about optimizing, you know, for finding the good manager. I think it also yeah. comes to one of the things we mentioned, uh, Marty, you mentioned about, you know, in your foreword as well, Phil mentioned earlier, hey, during the job interview process, a lot of times we as job seekers feel like it's a one way, you know, conversation. It's like, I'm trying to sell myself so that I get this job. But a lot of times then that means you're not really set up for success, right? Part of the negotiation of like figuring out first, I guess, like figuring out if this is the right manager, are you going to get the support you need in addition to the paycheck that you get every month and the stock, but also maybe better coaching, better training, better resources. What are your tips on like figuring out is this person, the stranger that I'm talking to is the right manager? How do I ask for support? How do oh, I tee up that conversation important. when I feel like, you know, I don't even know if I have the job? 
This is the right question too. I mean, so first of all, I tell people, you know, your job is to convince them you are the perfect candidate for this position, of course, and that's, you, you want to understand that, but you also want to be convinced that they are the right job for you. So on this other side, you heard us talk about both Phil and I, we talked about doing some, uh, homework, due diligence on make sure who you know, you know, make sure you know what you're getting into, both the culture of the company. You can learn so much about the founders, so much on places like Glassdoor. Yeah. Um, and then through your network, try to learn enough. And you can learn a lot on honestly LinkedIn research on the background of your hiring manager. And what I encourage the people to say when they get the offer, right at the time they get the offer is to say, look, uh, I appreciate that you, you know, think I would be good here. I do too. However, I want you to know the reason I'm interested is because I want to work for you. And I say, I, I've done my homework. I know where you've worked before. I know the products you've created. I know your philosophy. That's why I really want to work for your company is I want to work for you. So what I'd like to ask you is, are you will? I, I think you can help me get much better and really reach my potential. Are you willing to invest in me? I will do everything I can, but are you willing to invest in me? Every good manager I know loves to hear that. Oh, they're <laughs> going to be like, blown away, blown away. Blown yeah. away. And it's like, that is because this is a person that knows what they're doing. They know what they want in their career. They know they're willing to put in the effort to get there. Uh, they want to hear that. And occasionally the manager will say something, you know, in my last company, I would have, but at the startup, I have no time. I need people that can hit the ground running. Okay. I want to know that at least. Yes. And they're being honest, but most of them will say, you put in the effort. I will put in the effort. Let's do yeah. this. Yeah. I I love that. And it's such a great, like, you know, as Mar as you know, Marty, I, in the book, I say, you know, I, I want you to create your own job, what I call job mission with OKRs. And, you know, when you get that offer, I love this, like combining these two, I, like, I want to work for you. You've done the research, as Marty said, you've looked at their LinkedIn, maybe you've actually done some more and your job search council can help you with that because they might know people who know that person. Um, which is another benefit, especially of being in a job search council with people you don't know. We call it the power of weak ties. It just magnifies the networks and information sharing. And then say, I want to work for you. I love this. I want to work for you. I want you to help me get better. And here are the things that I think I'm I'm going to need to do that. But but tell me what you think. Like in addition to cop, let's talk like depending on the role, if they're, you know, if you're taking a director VP, whatever role or above budget and resources support. But even if you're taking a low level role or an entry level role, you can still negotiate things like uh, training or development or coaching. You know, hey, I want coaching from you. I also want exposure to other people in the firm. What do you guys like if you're just saying those things, especially as a college graduate or someone early in your career, you're going to blow them away again. They're like, wow, this is someone who's really thoughtful and they're clear and they're going to be easy and fun to manage because they really want, they're, they're doing the job already. So. Yeah. I love that. Pearls of Wiston from Marty and Phil. So thank you so much. Um, we are coming up uh, at time almost. So I do want to finish with two more questions. Um, first question for uh, Federico earlier in the talk. Um, what are some trends that you're seeing uh, as far as in the product hiring space? Uh, what do you think hiring managers are looking for now? What are some new skills, especially with the recent explosion of chat GPT and generative AI? I think a lot of people feel very nervous about their job security. But uh, yeah, Marty, in your opinion, what are, what are some... Um, you know, trends that you're seeing in, in the hiring space for, for product jobs? Well, good product companies, they know the, the reason technology is so important. We were talking about that a minute ago. Why some is because the what's possible is changing constantly. So one of the things they're usually the good ones explicitly looking for in the interview process is how how quickly can you learn new technologies and assimilate them into your worldview and apply them. And machine learning is absolutely, it's one of the most relevant things right now. 
Totally. And and it's interestingly, it's you know there are implications that many some are obvious, some of them won't be realized for a few years. But uh, but it, one thing that seems clear to me is it's got big impact in a positive way for design and product. Um, yeah. It's got uh, it's got other implications on the engineering side, but I think for design and product, I mean, the business implications, the ethical implications, the the uh, business constraints, viability in oh, general. Dig into, yeah. Very relevant. So um, I, it does mean, though, that you need people that are not afraid yeah. of this. Because the truth is, some people are scared to death of new ch of change, and other ones uh, love it. Most product people that I know love change. That's sort of part of what attracts them to yeah. this whole thing. So this is a uh, an amazing time for people that really love to create disruptive products that solve problems way better than they ever could before. And if you've done some homework, it, certainly there's plenty of resources today to come up to speed, but make sure that you are going to them with some genuine excitement about what you'd be able to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I know Fareed and just gave an example who asked this question, but also trying to feature he's, he's, uh, he's comment, but he basically used the generated AI tools to create a video uh, to show off his skills to, to pitch to startups. So that could be a way uh, to, to, to use this. All right. It looks like and there's some just, problem with and, the stream. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Phil. I was just going to add to this question, but if there's another, if there's an essay with chat GPT, it's actually fairly easy to see that, that, you know, it's like a B minus kind of thing. So, you know, whatever, but, but wow, there are some interesting ways that it can augment, supplement. And what does it mean? We're just beginning to understand that. And I find that, you know, that what, like what you have to, you read, you know, that's one of the things that Marty and I also radically agree on. People aren't reading enough. Read, you know, and not just an article, but go get a book on generative AI and chat and machine learning and understand the main seven algorithms that are behind machine learning. And you again, you don't have to become a machine learning PhD. That's not going to be your role as a product manager, but you have to understand the limits and strengths of these algorithms and what it means and what is statistical based you know, algorithms. What what is that even what is that all about? What why are biases therefore built in and how can you, you know, what does that mean? You need to be thinking about those kinds of questions. The other thing I would say is that there is, um, we see this, you know, first of all, there's a lot more people in the tech world unemployed. You know this already, you're reading the headlines and you may have been un uh, laid off yourself. And that is affecting candidate market fit for everybody, right? So there's a bigger pool of candidates and it means that a job you could have gotten a year ago, you may not be able to get that same job today. Um, companies might have, there might be more qualified people, uh, in line. So you just, that's another way that you need to have an objective point of view on candidate market fit, right? And smaller companies are hiring, larger companies are not generally speaking right now that, you know, I just know someone who got a big tech job, so it's not impossible, but you know, in general, and the data shows this from the federal government, the big companies are letting people go. The small companies are hiring. Uh, that, in fact, small businesses are powering all of the growth and, and, the, and the continued strength in the job market today. So if you don't want to work for a small company, fair enough. That means you're, gonna, you're probably going to have to take a lower level role at a big company if you can get one. Um, but that's an important thing to keep in mind. All right. I think we're also coming up on time. Uh, we have gotten a lot of love despite the technical difficulties uh, from the community thanking us, saying that they're really enjoying the session. It's been very enlightening and empowering. So Marty and Phil, maybe I'll close it with asking you, what's one or two parting advice you like to give to this group, particularly folks who, you know, maybe lay off, maybe struggle with this current, you know, challenging environment, What's your parting advice to our community? Marty? Well, I, I actually love, because this didn't come up until right at the end when Phil was talking about the difference between large companies and smaller companies. Um, you know, I think there's a deeply held assumption from so much of the world that you'll be more secure at a big company. And that really hasn't been true for a long, long time, but it's still deeply rooted belief. 
yeah. for so many people. The last few weeks should like put an exclamation mark about how not true that really is. Um, but even if jo you know job security isn't what you care about, I really want to put a plug a plug in for working at a smaller place. It doesn't have to be a seven person startup. It could be a 300 person growth stage company, but there are, you you in general will learn a lot more than at a big company. Yeah. It's great. Love that. My, I from, would just say, you, yeah. yeah, of course, never search alone. Don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. And the only job searching is a four letter word. P H Y L. <laughs> Good. Oh, look. Phyl.org. <laughs> yeah, go. And we're so here to help. Make sure you it's check out. Free. Yeah, go ahead, Jimmy. No, make sure you check out the resources from, from field.org. Job search is a four letter word. I love that tagline. And thank you so much for coming up at time from Artie and Phil to spend time this precious hour with us. We have close to 500 people staying all the way till the end. Very few people drop off despite the technical difficulty. So that, that just speaks to how meaningful and impactful this is and across the, globally, right? Remember the star, we have so many countries and regions represented. So really, really grateful for that. And folks, if you want to dive into the specific things that we talk about, such as how to form a job search console, what things to look out for, how to find product, uh, candidate market fit, and then how do you negotiate beyond just compensation to set yourself up for success. Make sure you check out the follow session, um, you know, in the event description where you get the link, copy and paste them to sign up. Uh, for folks who are sensitive about signing up and notifying your network that you're looking for a job, just mark your calendar and join us live as well. Or welcome. And we understand yeah, the you sensitivity. You can just go to the link and search. just watch it live without registering if you want to do that. Absolutely. And, and I just want to say thank you to Marty. Marty, you've been such a such a friend and colleague to me and, and such a big supporter of this book. It's It really, you know, thank you so much. Thrilled to be able to do that. And I hope everybody does take it seriously and, and at least read the book. Do yourself a big favor. Thank you. Thank you. And Shivy, thank you, you're Marty, wonderful. And thanks, Bill. Yeah, thanks, yeah. you, Shivy. Yeah, Shivy, thank great you. moderation. Bye. You rock. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.